Hello and welcome to Brooks TV. I'm Alex Jacobs. And I'm Arish R.K. Coming up in today's episode. More chaos in London as the rise in tuition fees is confirmed. Would you take an aspirin every day if it lowered your risk of getting cancer? And we look at the life of the man behind the magic of Narnia. On the day that Parliament votes in favour of a rise in tuition fees, more protest rallies were held by students. But yet again, it was violence that made the headlines. Robin Hilda reports. Last week, protesters clashed for the last time before the vote on education cuts was decided in Parliament. Students took to the streets of London, leaving a path of destruction in their wake after a final day of efforts made by students, union members and MPs to boycott the cuts proved to be unsuccessful. Signing the pledge while at the same time planning to drop it was not new politics, Mr Clegg. It was old-fashioned cynicism. If all or most of those 57 Liberal Democrats who signed that pledge carried out their promises, there would again today be no market in higher education in this country. Shame on you! But after it was announced the vote had passed, protesters made their way to Trafalgar Square, setting fire to the Christmas tree and vandalising central London, where the atmosphere took on a tone reminiscent of that in the last two protests where students already had fears the vote would pass as a result of Lib Dems taking a U-turn on their promises. Well, it's disgusting really, it just shows a lack of integrity, the fact that you can just uh, completely go back on the promises. A lot of people voted for him for that reason and now he's just completely gone against it. Prior to the vote, we spoke to Aaron Porter, president of the NUS, about the Lib Dems' change in policy and the concerns by many that violence could break out again. Politicians who made promises to students need to honour those promises and politicians wavering about the detail of the policy fall on the side of realising that the cuts are too deep and too fast and the policies put forward will price students out of universities and stop many of our poorest students in colleges from being able to stay there. It's very important that students are given the right to protest but the way in which that is best done is where we win public support over to our side against the government and it's so important that we don't break the law in order to lose the support that we need. Violence was already taking place though in Parliament Square, where students had yet again been kettled late into the night and prevented from reaching the Houses of Parliament. It was later reported that 55 people were injured, 43 protesters and 12 of the 2,800 police officers deployed that night. Although this is the first major backbench rebellion in the coalition government, fees will now be rising to an upper limit of £9,000 come 2012. But despite that, it doesn't appear student outrage will burn out any time soon. A new study shows that taking aspirin daily could result in a lower risk of getting cancer. But it could also have serious side effects. So would you be willing to take every day? Eloise Greenwood finds out. Taking a daily low dose of aspirin could lower your risk of dying from cancer. This is according to a study which looked at approximately 25,000 patients, mostly of whom were from the UK. Those who took a low 75mg dose a day had a 20% reduction in cancer deaths. Peter Rothwell is Professor of Clinical Neurology at Oxford University. He said that it's been known for a long time that aspirin has health benefits such as preventing heart attacks and strokes. Now it's proven that it also helps with common cancers. Peter's colleague Tom Mead had this to say. Yes, aspirin reduces the mortality rate from a number of important cancers. The question of whether people should take it or not involves considering the cardiovascular effects of aspirin as well as the cancer effects and they should talk to their general practitioners about it before they go ahead with it. Taking aspirin can increase the risk of bleeding in the stomach and can cause ulcers and other health problems. With so many health risks associated with it, would you be willing to take it every day? Probably not just because I'm not that interested in taking medications every day. Um, they say taking vitamins is healthy as well. I don't. Just It's a personal thing. If people want to, that's fine. shouldn't be denied them. If it reduces the risk of taking cancer, uh, it doesn't seem like a particularly arduous task to take an aspirin from time to time. Um, yeah, can't see any reason not to. I think there are a lot of concerns about it, certainly for like stomach bleeding and stuff. And so I think the, the level that you'd take, as long as it's a small level, I think, I think would be acceptable, certainly. 
Now we've seen that taking aspirin can help to cut the risk of some cancers, further studies are being done to determine if aspirin could prevent uterus and breast cancer. The findings fuel an already intense debate about the benefits of taking aspirin. If you are considering it, ensure you consult your doctor first. I'm Eloise Greenwood for Brooks TV. So last year, the must-have Christmas gadget was definitely the Nintendo Wii. But what will it be this year? Oliver Corbyn investigates. As you may have noticed, the festival season is upon us, and this can only mean one thing. It's time to start the Christmas shopping. UK consumers spend more than any other European country at Christmas, both offline and online, accounting for 25% of all retail spending in Europe, while only having the 12th largest population. With Christmas sales forecast to hit £68.7 billion pounds this year, we have a look at the products that are battling it out for the Christmas must-have. For the last three years, Nintendo has been the force to contend with, with the combination of the DS handheld console, the Wii Home Entertainment System and the Wii Fit, and bringing interactive gaming to the masses for selling over 8.3 million Wii consoles alone in the UK, and that's one in every three households. However, both Sony and Microsoft have both been throwing their hats into the ring, both releasing interactive add-ons for their consoles, the PlayStation Move and the Xbox Kinect. But with Kinect having a £120 price tag and the Nintendo Wii with £169.99 compared to the PlayStation Move's £49.99, will the cheaper price tag tip the scales in Sony's direction? However, the undisputed king of Christmas has to be Apple, with both the iPhone and the iPod Touch being the most searched products last year over the Christmas period. We talked to Adam Ragozzi from Western Computers about the must-have items this Christmas. Oh, well, the best seller this year would probably have to be something like an iPad. Uh, it's been really popular since the release. Um, it's really great because obviously if you've used an iPhone before, you're going to know how to use it. And, you know, browsing the internet and playing games on the iPad is well, it's just great. It's good fun. The iPods are selling really good as well. Um, the iPod Touch especially because obviously it's really similar to the iPhone. Um, and there's loads of games. It's good fun. Um, and they come in three different sizes so you can hold loads of music if you want to. Um, but yeah, the iPad and the iPod Touch have definitely been the most popular, I'd have thought. Looking at the high street shops, HMV, GameStation and Carphone Warehouse all had the Xbox Connect in the front window, whereas Game had both the Connect and the PlayStation Move in the window, so the shops seem to be backing the Xbox system. It seems competition is still fierce with the Christmas must-have gadget, and we probably won't find out now until after New Year. I've been Ollie Corbin for Brooks TV. Back to the studio. A year ago, the council in Oxford controversially reduced the speed limits in residential areas. It was lowered from a 30 miles an hour to down to 20, but what difference has it made? It's been over a year since the Oxford City Council decided to make a radical change to the speed limits within the city centre. Nearly all residential areas were changed to 20 miles an hour from 30. So exactly which roads are being affected? The 20 mile an hour speed limit was introduced onto all residential minor roads in the city, unnumbered through roads, except where they were part of a heavily used bus route, and subsections of Main A Road and B Road network where there were particularly busy shopping areas. Although nearly all residential areas in the city have changed, there are a number of roads which are still remaining at 30 miles an hour. These roads have an average speed limit that is over 24 miles an hour and therefore have been said to be inappropriate. This means that any road that, is com that should be used for commuting can be kept at 30 miles an hour or above depending on the area. So there are three main reasons why the 20 mile an hour limit was introduced into Oxford. To increase safety levels and help reduce accidents. To improve the environment and quality of life for, de for pedestrians, cyclists and residents. To encourage more people to walk and cycle and reduce congestion and pollution. And to improve health. So is everyone in Oxford in favour of the slower speed limit? We interviewed Mr Alex Joyce, a local homeowner and resident, about his opinion on the reasons behind the change. It is beneficial to have a lower speed limit to reduce accidents, but I don't know how many accidents there were at 30 miles an hour in Oxford, so I can't really comment whether it's made a difference or not, but I can't imagine there would have been many, and I'm not sure whether changing it to 20 is making that much of a difference. Although the speed limit is a legal requirement for all road users, including cyclists, the speed limit is designed to be self-enforcing due to a lack of police resources. In an analysis of the UK's first city-wide scheme in Portsmouth, where the speed limit was changed from 30 to 20 miles an hour, it was found that it did not make a significant reduction in the number of accidents. It seems that most of the residents in Oxford are behind the change of speed limit within the city limit. But by lowering the speed limit, you are not necessarily going to make the positive change for the city. As more and more cities are converted to the scheme each year, it seems important to target areas that have a high concentration of accidents, rather than just converting whole cities, wasting taxpayers' time and money. 
I'm Ollie Corbin from Brooks TV. Back to the studio. Now, if you were in Oxford last week, you may have seen an odd sight. <laughs> About 1,300 Santa Claus in a fun run. But it was all in a good for a good cause. Jimmy Fung reports. Christmas shoppers in Oxford may get a shock on Sunday, as more than a thousand Santas are expected to run through the street for charity. The two most sponsored Santas on the Run event has been organized to raise cash for City Hospice, Helen and Douglas House, which provide respite and end-of-life care for children and young adults from birth to the age of 35. Uh, Helen Douglas House offers medically supported uh, short-term breaks and uh, end-of-life care for children and young people with life-shortening conditions. And we also have counselling and practical support for the whole family. There were more than 1,300 runners took part, raising more than £50,000 last year. The hundreds of centres were warming up near the Bridge of Science before setting off on the race from Kettle Street on half past nine. This is the fourth year of, of uh, Santa Run and as you can probably see in the background there are so many people that join uh, uh, Helen and Douglas House to raise money for this fantastic charity that looks after uh, children and, and young and people. No, I did it last year as well. With, uh, yeah. It's hard, it's really hard. It's a long way, it's cold, you know, there's a million Santas, you can't tell who you're with, it's brilliant. Well, it's the spirit of Oxford, isn't it? People are just up to doing anything they want. They're great, a thousand people. Two miles roads start from Park Street, Oxford University, Cricket Cup, South Park Street, Mansfield Road and Holywell Street. Refreshment will be available throughout the events and each runner will get a goodie bet at the end. Entry fee includes a centre shoot and finishing medal. In this fast-paced state of empathy and brutal ignorance, it is good to see people coming together, raise their awareness, have a good course and have fun. Although it is fun, they have still have many people suffering every day and waiting for help from the charities. It is streaming from, from Brooks TV in Oxford. That's it for this half, and we'll see you after the break.